So good morning, good afternoon. We are very excited to be starting our webinar on alcohol research and capacity building in Uganda. Um, I guess we had about over 100 people registering. We don't know if all of you will make it today, but we hope that we're going to have a really great conversation and really to continue the debate on how we, how we do great research and how we build capacity to do more um, protection and prevention of alcohol-related harm. So we welcome you. And for those of you in Uganda, we say in Sanise Okubalava, uh, we're really thrilled that you are joining us. All right, next. Um, I wanted to start with this African proverb because I think in terms of alcohol-related harm, it is really important that, that we think about how we work together. Uh, because if you want to go to fast, you can go alone. But if you want to go far, we have to go together. And I think that's what this webinar is about. It is really about how we can work better together. Next. So I, before we uh, start and I share with you the program of what we're gonna accomplish today, I just wanted to remind you of a quote from the World Health Organization on the Africa office. They said that there is no other consumer product as widely available as alcohol that account for as much premature death and disability. And I think some of the things that we'll share with you today will really underscore how big of a problem this is in Uganda and why we need to really come together to do more of the alcohol prevention work. The program today is I'm going to do a quick welcome and introduction of our fantastic panelists. Then I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Mbona to give an overview of the Alcohol and Drug Addictions Research Center at McElroy University. I'm going to then share a little bit of findings that we have from a survey we did in the, la in the fall or in November and December of last year to talk to stakeholders in, in alcohol prevention. I'm going to ask Mr. Kaziri to put the research finding into context, what it all means. And we're going to get some reflections from Dr. Abo, who's a psychiatrist. I'm so sorry, Dr. Swan. We've had a little bit of an internet interruption. Well, text box, uh, so that we get your reflections and input and whatever comments you may have for any of the things that we are discussing. And then we're inviting uh, Dr. Francis to do uh, concluding remarks about what it all means and next steps as, as we're closing out the webinar. So that's the program for our 90 minutes. Next. Um, so I'm Dean and Professor at the Wellstar College of Health and Human Services at Kennesaw State University. I'm an epidemiologist. I'm a former Fulbright, having worked closely with the team here on the, on the panel. Uh, and I'm in Atlanta, US. Next. Uh, we have Dr. Nazaria Zambona, who is an associate professor, Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. He's also the director um, of the Alcohol and Drug Addiction Research Center. Uh, we have Mr. Rogers Kaziri, who's the executive director with, for the Uganda Youth Development Link. And we have Dr. Kathy Abo, who is a senior lecturer and child and adolescent psychiatrist at the Department of Psychiatry, also at McCreary University. And then we have Dr. Joel Francis, who's a medical doctor, researcher, and epidemiologist in the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Care at University of the Watersrand in South Africa. So with that, let me hand it over to Dr. Mbona to share with you about the ADARC, or the Alcohol, Drugs, and Addiction Research Center. Nazarius, you're muted. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen in uh, East Africa. In, in, in the States, I think in the States. And then uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen in East Africa. Um, so my brief is about ADAC, which is the Alcohol, Drugs and Addiction Research Center. Next. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, we well know that really, really alcohol, drugs, and addiction are really big, a big, a big problem. And uh, every uh, harmful use of alcohol kills over 3 million people. And uh, the harmful use of alcohol causes more than 5% of the global disease burden. And globally, an estimated 237 million people, uh, uh, men, 237 million men and 46 million women 
suffer from alcohol use disorders. And Uganda is among countries with the highest per capita alcohol consumption. And there is a lack of sufficient evidence to aid decision making and implementation. Next. Um, the pictures don't come out very, very, very well, but uh, I think we shall make them better. Uh, and if you go to our website in a short, short time, you'll be able to see better, web, uh, better pictures. Um, but to respond to the lack of sufficient evidence, Alcohol, Drugs, and Addiction Research Center was established in 2018. And uh, it's also, um, its home is at McKay University School of Public Health. And uh, they, it's manned by multidisciplinary team. We, we are really a multidisciplinary team. Uh, we have social scientists, we have uh, uh, medical personnel, we have researchers from different fields. And we're all there really to, to come to a better way to respond, to come up with better evidence for our program and policy. And the, the overall goal is really to make sure that we really provide capacity and leadership in the, in the three research areas in Uganda and the region. Next. Um, and then lack of infrastructure to collect routine data is really one of our major limitations. And uh, inadequate coordination of research and dissemination is another uh, limitation. And also, members, you may want to know that Uganda is actually a young country. Almost 50% of our population is actually less than 15 years. Um, and also, you have to know that most young people are unemployed, which is really, uh, which is a problem. Um, the unemployment rate is among uh, is around 15 to 83 percent among 15 to 24 year olds, and then they also our census report showed that actually 58 percent of Ugandans don't have jobs. Um, Uganda is the second largest per capita consumer uh, in Africa after Nigeria, but but. Uh, uh, of late, I think we we are sleeping to. I think we are getting better now. Uh, the latest figures that we may be about this the ninth or the tenth. Next slide. Um, so the, the specific objectives of this ADAC were really to attract collaborative work, just like we are doing right now, and offer a one-stop center for latest information on alcohol, drugs, and addictions, and also. Uh, where we can actually mentor future leaders in research in the three areas of interest. Uh, work with the government and other stakeholders, translate evidence to policy. When you check on our website, you're going to find lots of uh, published work and lots of uh, work from the media and so on and so forth. And uh, we, um, so we, we are trying to gather everything important. When we pick something, we gather it and then we, uh, we try to see how we can digest it um, and then pick some few things which we can actually share with the policy and the program uh, people. Next slide. Um, I must say we've, we've achieved a lot, but we, these are just some highlights. Um, I want to tell you that we are yeah, a, um, a focal point for drug epidemiology network uh, uh, reports. Um, African Union uh, selected some countries to carry out uh, drugs epidemiology uh, surveys. And we monitor essentially issues to do with the epidemiology of drugs. And drugs can mean these are alcohol, this is alcohol, this is uh, cocaine and uh, tobacco and so on and so forth. Uh, we've facilitated training of visiting international students from Georgia State University. And uh, actually, even we've, uh, we've also helped some students from uh, uh, Wisconsin, College of, uh, College of Medicine. Um, then uh, we've created also a website to inform and educate against alcohol, drugs, and addictions. And uh, we've also attracted some collaborative uh, work and the funding for several alcohol and drugs research projects. I can name like over five projects which have gotten funding, partly because um, 
they, they, in a way, they, they will be working with the, with the center. And we've also mentored young researchers. There are some young people who have actually been uh, inspired by, by what they see at, the, at our website and what they see in the newspapers. Actually, even tomorrow, I think I'm meeting two students who will want to do something in Um So we've also hosted a Fulbright Scholar. Next slide. Um, we collaborate with the many institutions, definitely among the, um, the prime among these is the Ministry of Health, and then we have Ministry of, Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development, NGOs with substance use prevention focus, like uh, uh, Uganda Youth Development Link, uh, and not, actually not only focus on, on the delayed focus on prevention, but even, other, I mean, we also look at, uh, we collaborate with those who deal with also treatment. Um, but for us, you know, we are more interested to research and uh, we don't want to claim to be uh, treatment experts. No, no, no. It, it's really, we engage with them in areas of research. Then uh, NGOs involved in substance use treatment. Uh, yeah, I've mentioned this. Uh, with the National Mental Health Referral Hospital is also our big um, collaborator because um, uh, this is where really you get massive number of people with alcohol or related problems. And then we also collaborate with the WHO, UN, and then CDC. Next. Um, well, these are just, I was showing you just a, a kind of a few of the people who are really core to this, uh, to this work. Um, so you can see different people from different uh, uh, department institutions. Next. Um, but in a very global context, um, I think we've already um, looked at this. Um, next. So I was going to say, I was going to say thank you, Nazarius and uh, Dr. Mbona for, for the amazing work that you have done setting up the ADARC Center and um, really just focusing the research in a way that I, I'm not sure that there is any other center quite like it in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so again, your leadership has really been really profound. And, and I think, you know, like if we do more meetings like this and really get more stakeholder input, we can really help to shape that uh, research agenda. And um, just so incredibly grateful for, for our collaboration and, and you being a champion in, in this area. So. Um, as we, I'm going to share with you a little bit of, of some of the survey findings that we have done in collaboration with ADARC, but I just wanted to highlight one of the big things building on, on what um, uh, Professor Mbona just said, that when we talk about the alcohol problem, problem in Uganda, it's, um, you know, in, in the research that we have done, it shows that alcohol use is very common, um, it's commonly consumed among youth, it's poorly regulated, uh, the legal drinking age of 18 is not enforced, even though we are having conversations about increasing the legal age to 21. Alcohol is heavily promoted to youth and alcohol is cheaper than water and alcohol fuels violence, injury and HIV AIDS. So that's why we need um, to really come together and, and focus on this as a significant public health problem. Next. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about the survey. And again, I, I wanna thank again, uh, Dr. Mbona and the ADARC for supporting us on this. This is a collaboration with the um, East Africa Alcohol Policy Alliance. We did this research across five countries, but what I'll share with you today is just the findings from Uganda. So we wanna reach out and say thank you to Dr. David Kalima, who is the chair of the Uganda Alcohol Policy um, Alliance for, for this collaboration. And also, of course, to Mr. Kaziri uh, at the Uganda Youth Development Link, who was really instrumental in developing the survey and um, making also sure that it was disseminated in the community. So we just did the very brief survey in the fall. Um, what we mean by that is November and December of last year. Um, and so today I'm just going to share with you a little bit about what stakeholders in Uganda said about the alcohol problem and what we should focus on. Next. Um, the questions that, that we, when we ask the stakeholders in Uganda, what should we ask? What should we ask from you? Like, what do we need to capture in terms of building research strength and capacity? Um, and we heard things like, we want to know what the readiness, do we have capacity for alcohol prevention? Um, we wanted to know if, if uh, community-based organizations in Uganda are familiar with the WHO Safer Initiative. 
they wanted to know like what are our key priorities for addressing alcohol and harm like where should we begin and what are the key harms and predictors of alcohol related harm and we wanted to know if community organizations have the capacity or interest in conducting this research so in this short webinar we're not going to tackle all of this but i highlighted a couple of key findings that I think will, will be good for our conversation and, and really think about next steps. So next slide. So one of the questions we asked, you know, do you think that the measures taken so far to prevent alcohol-related harm in Uganda have been adequate? And so this is not percentages, this is number of respondents. And so you can see here that only two of our 40-something uh, respondents or 40-something organizations thought that it was an adequate response. So clearly the key message here is that there's more work to be done in terms of uh, preventing alcohol-related harm in Uganda. Next. We also asked, in your country, compared to other health and social problems, how much of a priority is alcohol-related harm prevention? Um, and as you can see here, um, you know, about five, five people, five organizations suggested that it is a high priority, but more respondents said it was a moderate or low priority, again, indicating that they feel like we need to do much more. Um, this one, we asked, what are the main types of alcohol-related harm in your country? Like, what kind of harm do you see? So I've highlighted, if you look to the left here, um, the ones with the, the highest responses. So injuries, gender-based violence, and HIV AIDS were recognized as the three most common types of alcohol-related harm. Um, you know, obviously, we, there's been conversations about COVID and cancers and suicide. But for some reason, they did not seem to uh, get as much support in terms of what are the worst um, outcomes. So I think we should have a conversation about this in, in, our, in our panel discussion. All right, next. We also asked, what do you think are the main risk factors for alcohol-related harm in Uganda? And again, there, there were lots of different responses, but the three most common one was unemployment, poverty, and cheap alcohol. So what that shows me is that the social drivers, you know, poverty and unemployment are, are really things that we need to talk about as we try to mitigate the alcohol-related harm. But also cheap alcohol, which, in, which reflects policy. Again, taxation is one of the key pieces that we usually talk about in terms of lowering alcohol use in any given setting or country. Um, and I hope Mr. Kaziri will, will talk a little bit about that too. What can we do to address the cheap alcohol? Next, we asked how widely are undergraduate or postgraduate educational institutions which devote some of the curriculum to alcohol-related harm prevention? Um, one person said they're widely available, but most weren't really sure uh, or thought that they were none. And so while there are many ways we can think about building capacity for research or alcohol prevention more broadly, I think we really need to think about too, about the educational institutions. And that's why it's so important that all of you know about ADARC at McGarry University as sort of as one place to go um, for training, but obviously we need to strengthen capacity and, and broaden it. Um, next. So then we also asked, do you think the number of professionals specializing in alcohol related harm is adequate for large scale implementation of alcohol related harm prevention programs? In essence, are there enough uh, professionals in Uganda? Are there enough people focusing on alcohol prevention? And one person said yes, but the vast majority obviously said that they were not. And I, so I think it just reflects that what all of us know is that we need more people uh, and we need to strengthen capacity for those who engage in this work. Next. And then we also asked about SAFER. Not sure if all of you know about SAFER, but SAFER is an alcohol control initiative that was launched by the WHO in 2018 to focus specifically on several related alcohol prevention measures. Uh, so the good news is that most of other respondents in Uganda said that they were familiar with it, but there are also many who aren't. So I think we need to think about how we can increase awareness about SAFER, the program, and the many tools that are available as part of that and are, are available on the WHO websites. So we can work on that. Next. So related to the SAFER initiative, uh, if you're not familiar with it, they, it's really a five priority uh, initiative, if you will. It's about strengthening restriction on alcohol availability, meaning making alcohol less available. It's about advancing and enforcing drink driving countermeasures. 
It's about facilitating access to alcohol screening, brief intervention and treatment. It's about enforcing bans or comprehensive restrictions on alcohol advertising and sponsorship. And it's about raising prices on alcohol through excise taxes and pricing policies. So we asked the respondents in our survey, uh, which priorities do they think are most important in your country? So we asked to rank these five, uh, one through three, three, four, five. So most people suggested that the key priority should be strengthening the restriction on alcohol availability. So we'll come back to that point in our discussion. Next. Uh, we also asked in their community, do people know what alcohol causes and contributes to various uh, illnesses and diseases? We asked about liver disease and violence and injuries, traffic crashes, HIV transmission, breast cancer, other cancers and birth defects. So you see here in the bars on the top that there was a, a strong recognition that alcohol causes or contributes to violence, to injuries, to traffic crashes and to HIV transmission. But if you look at the very bottom, you see that there's a, a generally low awareness in terms of alcohol causing breast cancer, other cancers and birth defects. So there is some great opportunity for us to strengthen those messages in terms of all the harm that is, is caused by alcohol. So we can come back to that as well. Next. I wanted to transition just quickly and share with you uh, just sort of two summary slides about some of the work that we've been working, that we've been doing over the last decade or so in Uganda um, with the Uganda Youth Development Link. Next. Um, so in our research with the population that is served by UDEL or the Uganda Youth Development Link, uh, primarily with youth who lives in the urban slums, we show important concerns, particularly among these vulnerable youth. A um, couple of key findings that we have published suggest that there's a high prevalence of condomless sex. There's a very strong linkage between alcohol use, HIV, and gender-based violence, which we sometimes refer to as the Saba syndemic. Uh, we have found that sex work is not only prevalent, but sex workers are often paid with alcohol, which is a problem in and of itself. Uh, we know that child maltreatment can largely be attributed to parental alcohol use. We have found that girls who are drinking are most likely be already be problem drinkers, even if they're 12 to 18 years of age. We know that the youth in the slums, and I'm sure Ugandan youth in general, are exposed to high levels of alcohol marketing. We know that many of them also own alcohol branded products, so however much they live in poverty and own very few things, they may have something with an alcohol logo on it. We know that alcohol is linked to perpetration of violence in general. And we know that many of the youth, particularly the vulnerable youth in the slums, often use alcohol and drugs to cope with their anxiety and their stress. Next. So I just wanna take a moment again, if any of you have interest in any of the specific reports, again, um, I published quite a bit with uh, Mr. Kaziri and uh, with Dr. Mbona and others. If any of you are interested in any of these research, we can always come back and talk about that. But we think that it's really important to highlight the unique experiences of youth in Kampala. And again, how we can strengthen the research and capacity building um, you know, to prevent not alcohol use in, in that vulnerable population, but also in other vulnerable populations. So next. So with that, um, that was enough of the preamble. We just wanted to give everybody a little context so that we're on the same page. So I wanna hand it over to Mr. Kasiri right now. Um, before we start engaging with the with the um, the panelist discussion about what this all means, so uh, Mr. Kasiri's reflections on any of these findings and his long work um, with with youth and other populations and representing Uganda in terms of alcohol and drug prevention internationally. Are you ready for us, Mr. Kasiri? Yes, I am. I, I hope people will be able to listen. Good afternoon to you and uh, my other colleagues. Happy to see some of their faces uh, because of COVID, you know, new normal. Uh, I'll make a, a brief uh, deductions because my question at hand is how do we put this into context so that uh, we can logically pick up one or, or two ideas. Um, I think what is coming out from the studies that these have been 
without breaking standards. Because we've not had any other person digging all this. Because what you hear is that in Africa, in West Africa, there are no studies, there are no information. So we are very grateful that you have been able to conduct this study and, and show that there are still gaps uh, which need to be filled. And, 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 and more important, the, the quality of evidence coming out from your studies, from the studies we have done together and the studies which have been supported by others, we are sure that uh, this is very important because it brings in the idea of knowledge transfer, capacity building. Capacity building not, not only for us, the, the seniors, but also that the juniors and mentoring and all that, which for me carries a lot of sense. And, and, uh, and uh, what is surprising is that the way you design, the way you develop, the way the researches are conducted, you know, there's a, local, there's a lot of local participation. For me, that's very important. And, and uh, because previously the studies have been done by developers in the West, they come and say, help me do this, do this, do that. But the local involvement, the participation makes it work. But also when you look at the areas you raise, whether people are aware of suffer, people are aware of the risks, whether people know what we should be doing, actually that shows that actually the information is lacking because you see a mixture of responses, responses which are not consistent. And uh, that implies that there is a challenge. There is a challenge, the way people, the way people are doing things. So. Uh, I think Monica, you are you are helping to 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 bring to table to bring to table what is really uh, the, the the issues at hand. And uh, you, from Western developers of, of such issues, you help to help us to reflect even on the way we deliver programs and picking up a few ideas from here and there which can help. But also the training, the training and, and access to other resources that is very very important. And lastly, my Submission would be that uh, I think Monica, you now I, I want to qualify you to make claims. Claims like these are <laughs> these are the foundation studies. These are studies, you know, breaking studies which are not there, and I think people can use them. Otherwise, we are very grateful for Ken Ken Kenwans University and the Gisi your former university and the people who have been participating. I appreciate. I hope I've been able to handle the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kasiri, for, for those uh, kind remarks and, and for your input. You have obviously been a, a, and, uh, and remain to be a, a champion for alcohol and drug prevention, not only in Uganda and in the populations you serve, but you have been a champion and representative for the, for the region and for Africa for a long time. So it's been a, a true pleasure to be working with you and do this work. Um, but I also think that we need, to we need to come back, I think, in the panel discussion to talk a little bit more because I know one of your favorite topics is taxation and increasing prices and, and dealing with alcohol policies. So, so we'll come back to that because I want to give the, the microphone to Dr. Abo to, to also just kind of weigh in as a, as a psychiatrist because we also know that there is a tremendous shortage of psychiatrists uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so we're thrilled that you're making the time to be part of this and, and sort of have joined our team too to, to um, engage in, in this research. So I just wanted to give you, uh, give you the floor, if you will, and, and share some reflections from your side and from your discipline. So welcome. So Kathy, you were still muted. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you so much, Monica. And uh, I send greetings to the rest of the team members and uh, our audience online. Um, as I was introduced, I am basically a clinician and that means I see patients. I have some skills in research and I, I also teach, so I do clinical teaching in clinical psychiatry. And that means I cannot escape seeing patients with alcohol-related uh, problems. And uh, what has really been bothering me is that we see these patients at the end of the spectrum. By the time they come to the mental health clinic, or to the psychiatric clinic, or by the time we are consulted to, to do consultation liaison in the medical 
wards. They are either withdrawing, and you know, by the time one withdraws from alcohol, they would have taken it for five to 10 years. That means they are dependent already. And at that particular point in time, they don't even know those ones who come to the clinic, I mean, those ones who are withdrawing and they're on the medical ward, they're admitted because of malaria, because of typhoid, because they've had a broken bone. And while on the ward, they will not have access to alcohol and therefore they will get into withdrawal. And that's the end, really the end of the spectrum. Uh, rarely do we see those who would have idiosyncratic reaction, you know, reaction out of the blue because you've taken alcohol, or uh, those who would end up to us because they have taken one too much once in a while. They are usually those who come presenting with physical complications like liver disease or something else. Now, that can be frustrating given the fact that we, the services are still lacking and, uh, and even the capacity to handle. We currently have for the nation one um, national referral hospital, which is Butavika Hospital that has the alcohol and drug unit. And uh, we have a number of uh, private providers, but not many Ugandans can afford. It's, it's expensive. It's uh, in Uganda shillings, I think per day is about 100,000 to be in a, in a rehabilitation center and not many Ugandans can, can afford that. So that, that uh, uh, made me as a person uh, make up my mind that, you know, I will only treat those that present with uh, withdrawal or intoxication or the complications and whatever happens thereafter, it, it, I, I kind of like shut my mind from it. So when this um, alcohol and drug and addiction center came up, when I was invited to come and join uh, the team of Professor Nazarius, I just got up. I did not think twice because it was something that was already in my mind in terms of what can we do outside the clinic. So this provided us who are in the clinic an opportunity to provide um, or to participate in finding the solutions to these problems before they get to the extreme end that comes to the clinic. And so um, the multidisciplinary aspect of this of this team is is very encouraging and it's good uh, that we we have this in place. Um, yeah, so so I just wanted to say that when it comes to the younger uh, the younger people, the children and the adolescents. It's, it's much of it does not end up in the clinic. They, they, they are in the community. For example, we have a, a community, one of the communities in Uganda that initiates the newborn with a local brew. So whatever happens to the brain when it has been initiated that early to local brew, uh, alcoholic drink, we don't know. And perhaps this might be priming the brain much earlier for, uh, for addiction to alcohol. Uh, there's the, the, another issue of when it comes to services, Minister of Health has the division of mental health, uh, neurological and substance use uh, disorders. But you see when, when it is lumped up like that, it becomes very difficult because the attention has to be shared across. And so it limits the attention that should be given to alcohol related issues that is prevalent in the country. And we also know that the, the Minister of Health provides minimum healthcare package, which includes mental, mental health, uh, neurological disorders and substance use disorders in primary healthcare. But what comes through 
and through is that primary health care providers do not provide services. So what are the barriers? So we must understand the barriers at that level and we must also work through um, who else can be involved in terms of uh, preventive uh, measures. So I'll stop here for now and can add on later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abu, for those uh, remarks. There were several things that you shared with us that I think are, are just quite profound, but, but the one that stood out to me, I think, the most is, is you know, people who are admitting to the hos admitted to the hospital for other health concerns, like you mentioned, I think it was malaria and tuberculosis or injuries, mm -hmm. and aren't recognizing that they're addicted or that they have a substance use disorder uh, you know, until the withdrawal symptoms set in, which then, of course, clinicians like yourself are called in to deal with. But I think that speaks to the, the, the slide that I shared earlier, that there is a, not only a sort of perhaps a general lack of awareness about alcohol-related harm in general, um, but that also that alcohol-related um, other, you know, alcohol is comorbid with so many other um, diseases and, and illnesses and causes cancers and, and other um, like I said, diseases and injuries. Uh, so thank you for those remarks. I think, again, I, for us to, to really tackle this, we need this interdisciplinary team and to think about, you know, for those of you that see, see patients or those uh, in need of services as, as we design research that is the most helpful to people like you, but also at the policy level, as, as you were mentioning, the needs for uh, you know, like the Ministry of Health or maybe even Ministry of, of Gender, for example, to really... Uh, tackle some of these issues. But with that, let's open up the panel conversation. So I have um, a co couple of broader thematic questions and I'll just, I'll just share them now, but I think we can tackle them maybe one at a time. Um, you know, we mentioned several vulnerable populations in terms of alcohol related harm. Who should we target? You know, I share work that I've done with the Uganda Youth Development Link has primarily focused on youth. And, uh, you know, Dr. Mbona already shared with us that in Uganda, the population is very young. So it, it makes a lot of sense to focus on the young people, given that uh, they are the future and there are many more young people than any other group. And so if we really need to tackle the alcohol problem, we need to focus on young people. But I'm sure that there are other vulnerable subgroups that we, we may want to target for research and prevention. So let's have a conversation about that. And as we think about that, I want you to also um, think about what research needs to be done. Uh, again, I think Dr. Abel just eloquently talked about like, what can we do at the treatment side and how can we prevent it? Um, we need policy research and we need research at a, at a, at a bigger scale. And, and how do we build capacity for all this research and prevention work? But, but let's start with number one, uh, what vulnerable populations should we target? Um, like I said, we focused on youth and I think we maybe need to do more work with the youth, particularly trying to figure out what works. But let's hear from our panelists. What, what do you think? Where should we, what, what population groups do we need to focus on? Who wants to go first? I know, for example, um, Professor Bona, you've done a lot of research with Fisher folks and Boda riders, for example. Do you want to share a little bit about your findings? Do you think we need to do more work in those populations? Are there others? I also know that you've written extensively about alcohol being comorbid with um, uh, other chronic <laughs> diseases. So the, I'm, I'm sure that there are, you have some thoughts for us um, where we may need to focus on some of our priorities. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Monica. Yeah, definitely, they are, uh, then there are several vulnerable populations we need to really, really target. And uh, we've, uh, I mean, several studies, including yours, that show that really slum areas really are bad off, and uh, a lot of effort should be done in those areas to really, really get, uh, uh, improve the situation, reduce exposure, uh, have a really minimized unnecessary alcohol advertising and so on and so forth. Um, then we, the Fisher folk, definitely another group which is actually uh, very vulnerable because of the long time they stay on the on the lake, and they they tend really, really to 
to, to take alcohol and too much of it. Uh, we also have poor communities dotted in different parts of the country. For example, we know that northern region of this country, uh, people take alcohol more than actual other regions. Although the eastern region is coming up because the the post-war waning off, so we, we are seeing eastern Uganda actually uh, taking on really the role of northern northern region. So. Uh, if there's any effort, uh, any program which is focusing this, if there's uh, any form of sponsorship or whatever, definitely uh, in, by region, I would say maybe northern region and probably uh, eastern region. And in terms of population ages, we know that uh, the the middle uh, middle level, the, uh, these, these people who are uh, aged like from 20 to 34, that age group definitely takes a lot of alcohol. And the uh, young people take like taking alcohol, but most times they don't have enough money to really uh, go around with the alcohol consumption. But uh, that age group, the middle age group, definitely they, 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 they need some intervention. Mm -hmm. um, we are seeing the ratio um, traditionally, the ratio of men uh, who are drinking compared to the women who are drinking it has always been really, really um, it, has always, it has always been wide, I mean, but, but now you can see that the, the women are also coming up. Actually, in some sessions in, in America, they, they are leveling off and they, you can't see really much difference. But uh, I, I can assure you, yes, we need some intervention. Yes, one can say, let's have, let's have access, let, let everybody has equal access, but one has to know that Ladies actually get more intoxicated earlier than, than men in terms of the amount of, you need to take before you reach intoxication level. Um, so yeah, these are there, there are many, many issues, many, many kind of categories we can take the whole dynamic there. But I would think those the focus in those areas could be really uh, something to really uh, to, to work on. Over to you, Monica. Well, thank you, um, and thank you, thank you for for those remarks and and for sharing those high risk populations with us and and keep up all the great research that you do. Um, I was going to ask um, Dr. Francis, do you want to weigh in on this too? I know you've written uh, extensively about alcohol, and and actually one of the first uh, systematic reviews that I found on on youth in East Africa was written by you, which is it was you know just kind of bringing the circle back in terms of how I got connected with you and your work, and and of course recently we collaborated and and uh, demonstrated how few alcohol related interventions there are um, on the continent. Do you want to remark a little bit about that work and also how you see what vulnerable populations that we may want to focus on? Thank you so much, Monica. So yeah, so I, I echo uh, Professor Bonner's uh, comments that the young people are the most affected um, uh, population when it comes to, to alcohol use. And uh, from our previous work uh, in East Africa, especially the systematic review, uh, it was clear that um, uh, the alcohol use was very common among young people. And the most affected groups were uh, sex workers, both male and uh, female sex workers and college students. So these are the highest levels of, um, of alcohol use. But then I would also want to go back, if we are really keen to uh, focus on primary prevention of alcohol use, I think we should not neglect the uh, learners who are in primary school because you need to target them before they start, um, they start you know, consuming alcohol. So we need to have uh, like a tired um, types of inter tired um, levels of intervention. So the primary prevention whereby you we want to stop people from uh, consuming alcohol. So you need to give them uh, the right information right before they start consuming. And then uh, target the groups that are already affected, the sex workers, college students, and unemployed, um, unemployed young people. So for, for the survey that we did in Tanzania, so the college students and um, unemployed uh, young people uh, had uh, reported highest levels of um, alcohol consumption. Uh, and uh, these are the groups that could be targeted. But I think it's also important for other potential groups 
uh, individuals with comorbid conditions, people with hypertension, um, HIV, for example. Uh, I think these are also vulnerable in the sense that uh, these conditions are, um, you know, closely associated with alcohol use. So I think these are also uh, prime or targeted population for for potential for potential interventions. Thank you, Monica. Over to you. I have a plane flying by right now, so I was muting myself. Hopefully, you can't hear it. Um, no, thank you. Uh, and again, thank you for that for that insight about the work that you've done in Tanzania. Um, and interestingly, we did this survey um, in Tanzania as well. Um, and so it'd be interesting to compare a little bit too. Although of course, we didn't have that kind of specific information, as this is just really from community-based organizations and stakeholders more general. Um, we are, uh, we are getting some questions from the chat. And so I thought maybe we should introduce some of them as we're talking about vulnerable populations and research and capacity building. But um, from one of our colleagues um, in Nigeria, the chairman of the West Africa Alcohol Policy Alliance, Dr. Amense just asked um, about the, the widespread knowledge about the SAFER initiatives. Remember that slide I shared earlier. In Uganda. So the widespread knowledge about the SAFER initiative, does Uganda have an alcohol policy and is SAFER included? Uh, can I give that question to you, Mr. Kaziri? You're muted still. Okay. Um, yes, we've got an alcohol policy, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Ambonaz, uh, Kalema, who have worked so hard. Of course, with the support from the Minister of Health. So we've got an alcohol policy quite extensive and up to date with the developments at WHO and at the region office, including some of the studies which have been done. Uh, we are working towards having a, a division of an alcohol law. We hope this will be done in the shortest watch, in the shortest time. Uh, the, the other comment I wanted to make, Monica, was uh, I've looked in the past researches with that, but I've not seen studies which explore the protective factors. I want to agree with Joel. If, if we are looking at prevention, now, instead of blaming young people that there's a spike in drinking, there's a spike in drinking, too much drinking, we need to study the young people who are not drinking and say, what are those factors, protective factors which are there? Because they appear to be men. And the, that information will be very helpful. Probably that will give us the points of intervention which we can use to, to scale up. I've not seen studies which I've seen parental factors in our studies, which have been explored, but I think this will be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kaziri, for, for answering the question, but also for, for raising the question. I think about, like, sometimes we use the word resilience. Uh, you know, what, what can we strengthen and buffer against all these external influences? I know we've not talked much about alcohol marketing yet, but we know that there's very aggressive marketing in Uganda particularly targeting you through music and sports and, and you know, other, other venues. And so, so, yeah, so figuring out how to strengthen resilience, I think, will be a very important research project to do, uh, primarily for the youth, again, who are, who are just so exposed to so many of the vulnerabilities in this context of poverty and, and unemployment that we just raised earlier. Um, but I also wanted to bring back a comment, that, um, a question that was also raised from, from Dr. Menzi in Nigeria about whether our survey asked any questions on, on sachets, the alcohol sachets, or any cross-border sales in the survey. And, and unfortunately, we did not. Uh, you know, I, I think that those are, are some really important points, but I also know that there's been uh, legislation regarding the sachets in Uganda. I can't say I know the latest on it. I know it was banned a couple of years ago, but when we talked about this, I think last year they were still for sale. Uh, which one of you want to want to test that question, Dr. Mbona or um, Rogers? Which one of you want to respond? Um, what, is the, yeah. what is the status yeah, thank, of the thank, sachets? Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Um, Actually, the, um, the, the, this country, and the, uh, we are actually trying to study the uh, the impact of the ban. But I want to tell you that we, from observations, we no longer see uh, uh, this the shape of the packets. We no longer see these littered in different parts of the country. 
to be. Uh, but we also know that manufacturers have started uh, putting alcohol in small, um, hard plastic uh, bottles um, to, to, so that one thinks they are not sachets and they, and they think they can get away with that. But I can assure you um, the long arm of the, of the, of the law would definitely uh, get them. We, we, we should, those ones would be banned also. Um, I think that's what I can say. Maybe Rogers may want to add something. Of, of, of course, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of information and data if you are to get rid of the alcohol searches. On the general outlook, you assume, you think that the searches were eliminated. I think we can use the word metamorphosis, you know, change. It. And uh, like uh, Dr. Mbona has said, now you have small bottles, almost the same size, like the sachet. But also we are being told that outside the city, sachets are being, you know, being used, are being sold. So this study will be very helpful to inform us what is actually going on. I, and I think government is not doing much about alcohol policy. And as we speak, I think government has a lot on the table that they need somebody to stand with them, to help them, bring information, and to do some proactive work. I think they listen, and they are willing to see maybe some of the recommendations and change. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Thank you both for those for those great responses. Very important work, Kimbona. We uh, really look forward to see what, what's going to come out of it. And I think it could be uh, a model for other countries potentially as well. Um, another question came in, taking us in a little direction, but very important one. And that is, what are the measures in place to ensure education rather than incarceration? I assume it is really intended for alcohol-related harm and, and all the, you know, the various harms that um, people are placed in, in terms of the context of alcohol. So I think primary education and primary prevention, which we've touched a little bit about, but what else can we do? Suggestions from, from um, the panel here. What can we do to educate rather than incarcerate? Anyone? Yeah. I, I thought uh, Kathy would help us here, but if you are looking at the admissions at uh, the hospital, mm -hmm. I'm not aware of incarceration arising out of excessive use of alcohol. Maybe if it is uh, breathalyzers and road traffic. That hasn't been used as a tool. Though I know there are many young people who are in prison, probably by the time they come out of prison, they'll have learned some of these behaviors of drinking, excessive drinking, and uh, use of drugs. So prison is not a common use for alcohol, unless if it is a combination, comorbidity. I mean, combination of violence, uh, you know, being idle and disorderly, disruptive behavior, you can't end up in prison, but you'll be there for a short time. But I think government is not using that as a tool, though that tool is used for other areas in the politics and where, you know, where the cancellation is very common. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, again, I, I echo that. I, I very rarely see the numbers uh, in terms of imprisonment or, or jail, but I think it's something worth looking into as well. Um, another uh, question came in from um, John Bosco Izunju, a colleague here at McIrary University, to ask, you know, could we consider diabetic patients, so a chronic disease, uh, given increased risk of complications? So I think embedded in that question, again, is a little bit of the comorbidity that we discussed earlier in that uh, many people who are suffering chronic diseases are also taking alcohol and perhaps not realizing that the alcohol may impact their treatment. Uh, alcohol certainly impairs their immune system. So there are a lot of reasons for why we need to reduce, um, you know, alcohol use in the, in the population, in particular with other chronic diseases. And I know Nazarius, I think you had just written and published. I can't keep up with all, all the papers you're publishing, but I thought I saw one where you uh, looked at alcohol consumption related to chronic diseases and obesity. Do you have anything to add to, to this conversation about diabetes or, or comments about chronic diseases and alcohol use that fits here? Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is true that there is a common, there is a alcohol use and the, among these uh, diabetic patients and also even obese, obese patients, uh, obese, uh, those who have obese complications as well. Um, yeah, so the, and the, this tends to, um, 
to, to increase some level in the Middle Ages and then reduces later on. Um, yeah, so definitely it's happening. And the, uh, the, there is a very strong um, association with the, um, uh, with the, what the, 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 the prevalence, as I said, the prevalence tends to increase and then later on reduce, later on. But I want to tell you that the, um, with obesity, we didn't see a very strong pattern with age group. Uh, it wasn't really, really quite, quite significant, but it definitely with, with diabetes, the, the, the pattern, what I've what I just mentioned was actually quite significant along different, different age groups. Um, protective measures people are using, uh, they, they definitely there are those uh, who are trying to do exercises. Uh, there are those who are trying to change diet. There are those who are accessing medical treatment and uh, although still very few. So I think that's what I can say as of now. Uh, we have, we, we plan to do more research into this if we get some more funding. Over to you, Monica. Thank you, um, and and again, I, I you know thank the thank the thank the the person who wrote the question because I think it's important that that we really look into the chronic diseases. Um, you know, we know that they're escalating overall. You know, across sub-Saharan Africa is is sort of lifestyle factor and, and obesity, which uh, may drive some of these, and and alcohol is a factor in all of it. So thank you for your response. I think we really need to strengthen that that research. Um, another question that came in um, from Mr. Napoleon, which is also really inter interesting and very important and, and addresses again the different intervention or, or prevention strategies. So I'm going to read it. So prevention, intervention and policies should address malleable gators that promote positive development and reduce negative behaviors. Intervention and delivery systems should consider target population based on universal population or total population at all risk levels. Uh, but also selective known groups like children, drug users, as otherwise indicated, or individuals who already use drugs but are not yet deemed dependent, um, uh, I guess, in terms of malleable factors. So I think the point that, that he's trying to make here is that there is an opportunity for the universal strategies, right, where we target everybody. But there's also a point when we really need to focus on, on the um, you know, risk populations or those already indicated. So the work that I've done with Mr. Kasiri here, for example, we uh, have targeted those that have been already indicated at risk. But I think the conversation we had earlier is like, how do we focus on the resilience? Um, so I don't know if you want to add something to that, um, Rogers, that might be helpful. You're muted, Rogers. On my Rogers, side, I just yeah. want to agree with the Napoleon. I want to agree with the Napoleon Ezra that uh, the malleable factors need to be promoted, need to be escalated, so that those who haven't developed negative behavior can sustain the behavior. But that takes a lot of energy. That takes a lot of effort. I mean, I mean you need everybody to be active, uh, not to leave it to NGO civil society, as it is a common practice here. Apart from the school of public health and, and the civil society, the issue of alcohol cannot really central. But when you look at this, the negative effect and the harm alcohol is causing to this country, it is worth investing a lot of some effort and some money so that those who are doing research can do it, but also develop interventions which can help to reduce their, work, to reduce their problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I'm sure that we could have a conversation about all of that for an hour in and of itself, but we're super thrilled that the questions and comments are coming in. Um, from Lawrence Odoyo, he's asking, what is the government of Uganda doing to handle the increase in alcohol drinking among youth? So we've covered a little bit. We've heard from um, uh, Dr. Abo too about, you know, the Ministry of Health, um, you know, the, the unit that tackles mental health and neurological disorders have a lot of responsibilities to do. We also heard uh, Professor Mbona talk about the, the policy, right? There is a policy in place. Um, Mr. Kurziri also commented on that a little bit. I don't know, are there other initiatives that we didn't mention yet that the government is doing, that the Ministry of Health is doing to address alcohol use? I can't think of any, but 
I'm opening it up to the panelists to, to chime in. Um, the, 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 the means of death um, uh, definitely has a lot of things to handle, but uh, I would do, I would re echo the issue of policy. I can show you lots of uh, where well, we've been informed that they were of the policy and the. Um, I think the president is likely to inaugurate it any time, any time from uh, next month. So I think, and in this policy, definitely uh, the age limit uh, the, the minimum age is increasing to and uh, the exposure are necessarily uh, being really lowered into, into alcohol consumption. Um, so you won't be able to just do anything as, as there's been anything to attract uh, people to take alcohol. They definitely this has been, uh, this is going to be reduced in this with implementation of this, uh, of the policy. Um, I think that's what I can say as of now, that's what I'm seeing uh, happening. I'm not aware of anything else apart from that. Over to you. Yeah, I know. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I know, for example, this wasn't targeted to youth, but the Obulamu campaign that was launched a couple of years ago, I think it ended about a year and a half or so ago, um, that was focused on, on HIV specifically, like never mentioned alcohol, which I thought was a missed opportunity. So I think that there are ways that there are big campaigns, um, and I think some of them just needs to be focusing on you specifically, given um, the issues that we already talked about. But uh, changing gears, another question, uh, this is for, for Dr. Francis. Um, someone on the call, one of our online participants, wanted to know that the results that you spoke about from Tanzania, are they available? Have they been published? Thanks, Monica. So uh, all the pub, all the uh, the pub, uh, papers have been published. Uh, they, they are open source, but I'm happy to share. We don't have uh, the papers in one link, but uh, I could share the paper separately. Mm -hmm. But they are all published. Well, thank you. Uh, so again, if if you send any questions to us, we're going to share. I, I think at least my email is shared in the end, and also we have participants' emails. We if there's interest, we could certainly follow up with, with some links and resources to make it easier for you to find that. Um, I, just like Francis and, and many others, try to open most of, uh, publish most of our uh, research in open access to make it easier for everybody to access those. Um, here, another question from Paul Ibusu, our um, colleague in, I think it's cancer prevention, right? Cancer Society. Uh, asking how are we expanding involvement to other partners like the non-communicable diseases or the uh, subsector? How can we do that? Maybe for you, Nazarius. Um, maybe I can say that. The, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, um, I would say really, um, it's um, we have to engage with them in the. In most activities we are talking about, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the paper which I wrote on uh, on diabetes and the obesity and alcohol use, um, I was I wrote it together with Minister of Health officials, um, all the key officials of the Minister of Health. Um, so and the campaigns, whenever I want to have a campaign, as they, maybe you can call Police Alliance or whatever, we've always engaged the Ministry, Minister of Health, and the. And energy. I think yes, the collaborative. Oh. Uh, um, effort is on many people as possible. Whenever there's anything, uh, the NGO and the government. I think we are trying to uh, organize the event, uh, and the, the key person was the, uh, Mr. Napoleon Ezra, and the. So you can see, I'm from academia and you have the church. So I, I think um, cooperation is going on and we just need to be alert to know that uh, more and more uh, of these events, we are working mm -hmm. together with one voice. Over to you, 
Monica. Um, no, thank you. Uh, but I think the whole idea of, of, of building broader coalition and bringing people in, um, you know, again, because most of my own work has centered around young people, um, cancer and chronic diseases weren't really a topic that I that I have been um, actively engaged in. But I think as we're as we're now broadening the research and also recognizing, um, and also thanks to Professor Bona's work, you know, we, we really need to step up and, and focus on other populations as well. So I think it's a um, you know really good point that that again it, it takes a village. We need to come together and, and really strengthen where there are opportunities for collaborating. There is there is really no way around that. So I think this is a call for action in, in that sense. And maybe we can have a follow follow up meeting in, in as areas with ADARC and, and also look at priorities. Um, for, for targeting topics that we may not have been as proactive in. So several important comments are coming in. Um, you know, Faith Kimbasi said uh, earlier in a comment that she agrees that the government does not enforce, but, you know, local councils can really be important to monitor, in particular in rural villages, young people that uh, take alcohol. We've got another comment uh, from Barbara Nakijoba to say that research also need to focus on street children because many of them are using a combination of many drugs and alcohol and aviation fuel. And actually we have published some on that uh, in our coll collaborations with the Uganda Youth Development Link, but certainly totally agree that there is there's some other research needed on that. Um, we have gotten some comments from uh, Nella Nidrangu uh, from the Anti-Drug Coalition in Kenya. So thank you for joining us. A comment that out of her working experience with youth in rural Kenya, that peer influences is really critically important in that, you know, we need to target youth before they start drinking. And I think that that was a point that resonated earlier in that, you know, youth in their formative years that we really need to prevent. So I think we covered that, but it's a, it's a really important point. And I think you dealt with their social strengthening, really focus on, on peers and also for, for the young girls. Um, uh, some other question we are getting, uh, again, lots about how can we actively involve youth and other vulnerable groups in alcohol use prevention. So I think it's like, what can be the, the stakeholder movements, grassroots movements? So there is sort of a call to action coming in from many people. But I, I know that time is never really our friend in these things. Um, uh, so Aloysius from Embarara University was really hoping that we also talk about how can we build international collaborations as part of the capacity building. So I wanted to transition the conversation a little bit. What are the next steps for capacity building? So some of the comments we just highlighted about grassroots movements and, and building that momentum and, and championing stakeholders and community-based organizations on the ground to, to really build that momentum. I think that's one key part. Uh, but to Aloysius' comment, you know, how do we build these international networks? Um, I think he probably asked it from a researcher's perspective. So share with us some comments. Um, um, I know I have, have worked very effectively with all of you, but how can others kind of learn from this model or uh, how can they join ADARC in these areas? Is there an opportunity for other researchers to join or um, you know, Joel, you have worked with people also all over the world. What are your suggestions for how we can build these um, networks and, and strengthening alcohol-related prevention work? So this goes really to the whole panel. What can we do? What are next steps for capacity building? Who wants to go? Can I put you on the spot, Joel? How have you, how have you nurtured these international collaborations and been so successful in your work? Any tips that you want to share or suggestions for us doing this work here in East Africa? I think thanks, Monica. So, so I think it's um, it's critical for uh, for local and also uh, international collaborations, and uh, because if you you don't start with uh, local collaborations, it will be very difficult to attract uh, international collaborations. So mm -hmm. it's important to have like something happening on the ground before you really be, uh, you are able to interact with, um, you know, or to collaborate with you, to work with you on the on the local 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 problems. So I would mm -hmm. say we need to um, motivate ourselves and the local researchers to be able to come up with research questions and uh, try to foster local local collaborations 
and then uh, try to enforce maybe south to south, for example, Uganda in Tanzania, Kenya in Tanzania. we be able to attract uh, Georgia State University or other university to collaborate with you. So the, the main challenge with um, alcohol research, I must say, is, um, is, is funding. Uh, but then there are ways to, to go around it. For example, uh, integrating with other programs that people have mentioned, the NCDs, HIV AIDS. Uh, but then, so in a way, so you, you know, you need to have um, clear search questions and identify people who are uh, interested to work with you, but also align uh, your questions with um, availability of resources. Um, um, I think that's uh, the only way to, 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 to do it. But then the other, the other simple or maybe the other common way is, you know, through even if you are still a local researcher, you know, attending conferences, for example, publishing uh, articles uh, in uh, open source international journals, uh, that can, in one way or the other, uh, allow you to attract, you know, potential people to, to work with you. So, so attracting is one thing, but sustaining the collaboration like um, Uganda Youth and uh, Makerere and ESU, that's another, another, another problem. But um, I, at least, you know, we must try to, to do something. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Naziris in a moment. I just wanted to, to say uh, thank you for those comments and echo the comment uh, also about funding, that resources are so scarce that Sometimes, and I think that's why the, the, the funding that we have received in my collaborations with UDEL has been primarily focused on HIV, because from a US perspective, that's where global health priorities have really been. Uh, they've already decided that they want to do a substantial investment for HIV prevention. So it's been very difficult to get funding for, for other related work. And so I think part of it is that we need to strategize and, and think about where the funding sources are. But over to you, Nazarius. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. Um, I think Mr. Dr. Dr. Kunda also asked the same things. Um, the, the, it's true. It's harder. It's it's harder and harder and harder. And what you, Professor Monica said, you, it can't be alcohol or drugs per se. No, it may not sell much. It will have to be uh, HIV. Too, or it has to be adherence drugs. It will have to be solving another. Another problem, comorbidities with the alcohol and drugs. All these uh, are things which we really, really have to, uh, to, to, to focus on. Um, getting anything, I think it's from my experience with School of Public Health, we've, we've been quite, I mean, somehow busy for the last, maybe last, like last four years, but it has been really very, very hard work trying too, too many things and uh, encouraging people out of the country to work with you. Uh, I think I'm working with several universities uh, uh, abroad, but uh, it's about presenting yourself as someone who can work with you. Uh, it's not easy also at times because it, it, it's not easy as I say, as, I, as I've said, but uh, I think it's worth worth trying. I wouldn't say there's a quick, a quick solution, a quick way forward uh, to solve this problem of funding, but uh, it's just sharing experience with, with our situation. But I must repeat, it's not easy. Over to you, uh, Prof. Monica. Thank you. Um, no, and, and again, commend the teamwork. I mean, all of you panelists um, uh, that are part of here, uh, you know, are on here because we have great collaborative relationships and many of you also work with other international universities and partners. I just wanted to chime in here and say too that our our colleagues from Kenya are, are making some recommendations. You know, one, uh, Nelly made, made a statement here that in terms of their local coalitions that they have grown substantially from two coalitions a couple of years ago to eight um, and really suggest again, the grassroots movements. Um, we have Ezra Napoleon again, also recommending that, you know, there's this organization, I think you say ISUP or ISSUP uh, is a very um, important resource here, again, for the, the grassroots movement and, and really focusing on substance use prevention. Um, I think it stands for the International Society for Substance Use Prevention. So there are, there are tools and resources and there are sort of frameworks for infrastructure that we can build. Um, so thank you for all those uh, suggestions from our, our, our neighbor in Kenya. Um, but I wanted to transition here, making sure that we have um, enough time for um, uh, 
Dr. Francis to, to make some concluding remarks too. So before we go there, were there any other sort of key points that any of the panelists wanted to share? So we've covered a lot about focusing on vulnerable populations. We focused a lot on, on different research areas, um, you know, that I think we'll just need to take a note of and, and, and create a research agenda, if you will, for, for the academy and for partnering with community-based organization and have that kind of rat, uh, grassroots movement in terms of what questions are really helpful for people on the ground. And then we've covered capacity building. And I think maybe on any of those three topics, any, any panelists wanna share before I um, hand it over for, um, for Dr. Francis concluding remarks here. Uh, yes, uh, Monica, I would just like to add that uh, in terms of research, there is need to demonstrate that alcohol is a huge barrier to capital development, particularly in rural areas. And uh, we've heard that the younger population is affected uh, most because if, if um, they start drinking at the, uh, an earlier age before they attain any um, academic qualifications, then that is going to jeopardize their, uh, their functionality as, uh, as, as adults. And so in terms of research, I think that is very important for the researchers to demonstrate that relationship between um, alcohol and, and alcohol use and uh, capital development. There is a, a community again here in Uganda where uh, by 10 a.m. in that community, all men are drunk and the women follow by about midday. So you wonder what kind of development is taking place if you know by 10 a.m. the men are drunk and by midday the women follow and perhaps with the younger children, with the younger group as well. So uh, looking at the bigger picture, we, uh, we need to think through uh, that effect. And in addition to that, um, I think about two years ago in 2019, um, the, UN, the UN report uh, stated that uh, Ugandans and I think maybe other parts of the Sub-Saharan Africa um, only reach about 30% of their full potential. And that, that, that statement really saddens me because uh, there's a lot of potential in, 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 in many, particularly the young people. But if as an adult, you only can reach your 30%, what is the contribution of alcohol consumption? to the fact that we are not able to reach our full potential. So I just wanted to add those two remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, very important comments. Thank you. Um, Nazarius, anything else you wanna add? Um, really the, uh, the, the, the focus, the, we've said it all, but, but really for the way forward, I, I would think, um, we should we should look for as much collaboration as possible from anywhere, from anybody, because at times we don't know who's going to bring what, uh, so that we can really um, do more. Because uh, I've been involved in the in the uh, in write up of this policy of this country, and even tonight we are adding on some. Uh, we we are modify. I mean, we are trying to edit out a few 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 things. Um, not editing, but actually looking at the references, just making the references are correct. But I can assure you, uh, we still need a lot of evidence. So anybody joining us for the research that is welcome. And the, again, research is about collaborating, collaborative work. We have to do much to make sure that we are attractive for collaborative effort. Uh, because when we are not uh, attractive in this, then that means nobody wants to, 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 to do any work with us. And by attractive, I mean, we, we, we really love research. We really do what we're supposed to do. And uh, we, we make effort in contributing to the write-up. Thank you so much. Over to you, uh, Monica. Thank you. Uh, Rogers, any, any other last comments before we hand it over to Francis? 
uh, I want to make a few, uh, a few comments within one or two minutes. One, there are many people who are willing to collaborate, but we, the people who are seeking out collaboration, our houses, yeah, or we just want to collaborate to get research and do all that. I mean, I mean, you must have, you are, they need to deal with somebody. For example, those who are accessing funding, for example, Dr. Ambona, uh, Dr. Kalema, all those are established. They have also been trying to share, publish the little they are doing. But some of our colleagues, you never know what they are doing. And that makes it difficult to collaborate with you because before they talk to you, they Google you, they search you, you are nowhere. And yet you are dying to get money for research. But secondly, what are the gaps? I, I like the question you posed. What are the gaps? The gaps should inform the research protocol we are looking at. For. We should not just say research, research. We need to have the gaps. What are the gaps? What is the literature saying? What is it coming from the community? And before that cannot be proved, it will be very difficult. But also intercollaboration, interdisciplinary collaboration can be very helpful. Some of our work we do, we do a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration. We even work with others. We are willing to share work with others. We are willing to have consortium. We are willing to put in a small component on alcohol. And that makes the, you know, the work very easy. But I'm very grateful. Thank you so much. Um, please have a nice day. All right, before I, I hand over to, to uh, Dr. Francis for our, the concluding remarks, um, I just wanted to recognize quickly, Paul Abuso uh, added some more comments um, to us and, and really also encourage us to think from a research perspective, you know, how can we get cost data, right? We know policymakers are very often driven by the actual cost of any given health problem. And, and I agree, it's something that I don't think we have done very well in Uganda or across Sub-Saharan Africa really demonstrating the, the cost. And so I think that that would really be important. And another comment that he made also is like, how do we get that next generation of researchers and policies, uh, and policy, our activists really engaged in, in this work so that, you know, there is some succession planning between, I know that there we've, we've had like the, the alcohol di prevention giants here on, on the call with us, but how do we train and mentor the next generation who will, who will continue this work? But with that, uh, let's put the slides back on, um, and we're going to uh, see what so, comes Sorry, Monica. On. I'm sorry, what? Sorry, Monica. So before maybe before before you put the slides, I wanted to uh, have two comments. Okay, go ahead. Um, so I, I think we have not touched the issue of um, uh, structural norms driving mm -hmm. alcohol use, issues of um, uh, culture, for example, uh, from our previous work in Tanzania, we noted uh, some of the regions, you know, they, they they have more people drinking alcohol because alcohol is um, regarded, you know, within their, you know, social and culture as a, as a normal thing to, to do. And um, so I think that's a critical issue to be addressed because if that's not uh, um, attended to, then we may, you know, they prevention efforts or uh, any interventions may not yield what they are supposed to yield. Mm -hmm. And then the second issue is um, uh, for Uganda, I think already there is a, uh, you know, a lot of baseline, there, there's, a, you know, enough data, enough literature on the baseline data on uh, the magnitude of, um, and the drivers of alcohol use. Maybe the, the next step should be, for example, if not yet, uh, is to pilot, you know, some of the, you know, um, interventions that have, um, have worked in elsewhere, like in the Western settings, uh, issues of screening and brief intervention, um, mm -hmm. you know, they could be, you know, I think that could be a priority at this stage and to see how best uh, such interventions could be integrated in um, routine health services, uh, for example. Thank you. So th those are my, my two uh, comments, last comments. If I well, thank you, thank you for making those. And and I think you do know that uh, I work with the research team in in Moshi, in Tanzania, to do exactly that, looking at the the screening and brief intervention and, and see what impact that has. We're fingers crossed that that work is fruitful, um, and that could be a model for other settings. So thank you. And again, I just want to acknowledge that there are so many topics we could have covered here. And, you know, I'm going to go back and listen to this recording. I mean, the traditional brew and, you know, the, the, the taxation uh, there, you know, from sort of the micro level to the macro level, there are, are potentials. But we wanted to have at least an overview as part of this conversation. But 
Let's put the slides back up. And we just again want to recognize here that it always takes a village to do these things. So we are very grateful to everybody behind the scenes uh, who have helped us, all the contributors and the participants, but and my students. But let's hand it over to Dr. Francis for his concluding remarks here. Next. Um, next slide. Thank you so much, Monica, and everyone. Uh, so I'm going to give uh, a brief uh, concluding remarks from uh, from this discussion and from um, the general knowledge on um, general understanding of um, alcohol problem in sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide, please. So, uh, so it's clear that alcohol is a significant public health problem in Uganda and, of course, in other cities in sub-Saharan Africa. And there are pockets of initiatives and collaborations to address alcohol use in sub-Saharan Africa. Uganda is, uh, you know, is ahead of um, of the game. Uh, you know, they have already established collaboration, and they are doing a lot of work on alcohol already. And uh, it has been um, um, described, or it's been reported, that young people are more affected, uh, in particular the sex workers, unemployed youth, and uh, college students. Uh, there are limited structural and individual level interventions in sub-Saharan Africa in general. And from our previous work with Monica and others, uh, we noted that most of the interventions have, uh, were carried out in um, South Africa and a few in Uganda and, and Kenya. So, and such as BAN is, is one example of um, intervention that has been uh, implemented, for example, in Tanzania and Zambia. And I'm, I'm not sure about Uganda, maybe in Uganda also, the such as we are banned. And uh, a few countries have national policies on alcohol use, but most of the African countries, uh, as far as I'm aware, they, they lack, uh, they lack uh, national policies. Next slide. Uh, so we, we have touched also on potential interventions. So there are policy level interventions, for example, uh, having an alcohol policy that uh, guides the intervention strategies in the specific country. Uh, issues of uh, increasing uh, price, uh, reducing availability, access and marketing of um, alcohol pr uh, products and uh, establishment of uh, alcohol treat, uh, is, you know, including alcohol treatment in the health guidelines to ensure that whoever is stepping in a health facility uh, is screened and uh, treated if he, uh, he present with alcohol use disorder. Then there are individual level interventions. And here I think we need to pilot and adapt alcohol interventions that have worked elsewhere. Uh, for example, we may, I mentioned earlier and Monica alluded to that, the issue of screening and brief intervention and motivation interviewing. And then we could, we could explore uh, innovative ways to deliver uh, such interventions. Uh, for example, you know, making use of the digital technology. And um, most critical to, to try to integrate screening and, uh, and brief interventions in routine health services. And uh, mass campaigns, for example, to, improve, to increase the awareness on um, um, harmful effects of alcohol use, and also maybe potentially, if possible, uh, alcohol screening. Next slide. So lastly, on capacity building in Sub-Saharan Africa, so um, establishing alcohol and addiction research centers, um, for example, North and South collaboration, for example, the uh, GSU, Makerere and uh, Uganda, Uganda Youth uh, Development, uh, uh, Uganda Youth Development Center, um, South-South collaborations, as we mentioned before, uh, trying to increase training opportunities, for example, short courses and postgraduate studies. And uh, local collaborations, um, a good example is uh, UDA in Uganda. Uh, we know funding is limited, but we could try to integrate alcohol intervention with ongoing uh, HIV AIDS and NCD programs. For example, uh, the DREAMS project is a very well-funded HIV uh, program, uh, but um, you know, there is no inclusion of um, uh, alcohol intervention, which is actually a driver of some of the risks uh, that um, uh, young people or uh, vulnerable uh, young women um, has. Um, thank you. Next slide. So with that, I say thank you so much for attending the webinar. Uh, together we can do it as uh, Monica has alluded before. Thank you so much. So on that fantastic uh, concluding remark, I wanna thank all of our panelists for, for making the time and for preparing and, and for joining us. I, 
I hope this will not be the last conversation we have. This topic is so important. We can do it. We can do it together. I want to say thank you to everybody that joined us online. We have we are going to see if we can make a, a, the recording of this available. And if so, we'll share it if, um, if there are others who may want to watch it. But again, to everybody who joined us. Um, we thank you and, and hope that we'll, we'll continue this conversation, the research, uh, focus on vulnerable population and capacity building to do all this work. So thank you.